Okay, so thank you everyone uh, for coming today to the Seismic Academy. Our session today will be on shear flow, a critical topic in solid mechanics. So before we start, I would like to give you a little background about myself. I'm going to my third year of civil engineering at the University of Toronto. I've been on Seismic in both my first and second year as a general member and construction lead respectively. This year, I am a junior structural design lead. I hope this session will help you further your understanding of the concept of shear which is a critical portion in, of our tower's construction, specifically when looking at tower failure and shear. By exploring shear flow, we can better understand the stresses developed in the tower and how to strengthen it against the shear fail failure. So the topics we will be covering today are as follows. What is shear flow? What causes shear flow? How to find shear flow? How to find the force developed on nails due to shear flow? And how to find shear center? So what is shear flow? First, before we dive right in on how to analyze shear flow, we must first understand what it is and how, to, and how it is developed. Shear flow is defined as the horizontal or transverse shear per unit length, generally measured in kilonewtons per millimeter. Shear is developed in complementary pairs. What this means is that shear forces that develop in different directions on an element are equal in magnitude. This is necessary to satisfy moment equilibrium. If their magnitudes are not equal, the element would spin as the parallel shear forces in opposite directions would generate moment couples that would make the element unbalanced. As we know, when an element is fixed in some way and subjected to a load, internal shear forces and bending moment forces are developed. In our case, we'll be looking at bending moment as the primary cause for shear flow. As an element experiences bending moment along its length, the moment changes in magnitude, creating regions of higher and lower moments. The figure on the slide shows the cross section of a beam and how the moment differs across its, across its cross section. If we take a very small difference along its cross section, one side will have a higher moment than the other side with the difference of dm. dm in this case represents a small change in moment since we were looking at a small change along the element's length. Now, when an element is subjected to an internal bending moment, it develops stresses that cause the element to experience either tension or compression with the stresses being zero at the neutral axis, the element centroid. We call that stress is denoted by sigma and is equal to the bending moment m multiplied by the distance from a point to the element's neutral axis, y, divided by the second moment of area, i. The stress profile is linear as shown below. As established previously, one side of the cross section will have a greater moment denoted by difference dm. This difference also corresponds to a difference in stresses as one stress will be greater with the difference of d sigma. These stresses can then be turned into force vectors. When they are turned into force vectors, there will be an imbalance, as the side with D sigma will have a greater force. As a result of this imbalance, internal shear stress is developed, and it flows from the region of greater moment to the area of less moment. To develop a formula for the shear stress developed by this imbalance, equilibrium must be analyzed. The lesser shear stress region, sigma, may be denoted by sigma 1. The area of greater stress region, sigma plus D sigma, may be denoted by sigma 2. The forces must be balanced in the elements. The integral of sigma 2 over the cross-sectional area must equal the integral of sigma 1 over the cross-sectional area plus the shear stress multiplied by the length of the section. That is, the difference between the area of greater and lesser moments. So before I move on to the next section, does anyone have any questions about um, how we developed this formula? OK, then I'll move on to the next section on how to find shear flow. So after some manipulation of the previous formula, we get the following equation. Shear stress denoted by tau is equal to the load on the beam multiplied by the first moment of area divided by the second moment of area multiplied by the thickness of the section perpendicular to the shear stress. It is measured in kilonewtons per millimeter squared. Shear flow denoted by Q is the same formula as shear stress, except it does not consider shear over the area, only along the lengths of the element. Therefore, it does not consider thickness. It is measured in kilonewtons per millimeter typically. To properly understand how to find shear flow, we must first understand how to find the first moment of area, Q. Q is defined as A multiplied by Y. A is the area above or below where you want to find shear flow or shear stress. A is above where you want to measure if the point is above the neutral axis and below if the point is below the neutral axis. Y is the distance from the neutral axis of the entire element to the neutral axis of area A. So here we see some examples of finding A and Y. 
with the shaded regions denoting A and the Y distance shown. The point where we want to measure shear flow is always on the edge of the area A, and it increases along the direction of shear flow caused by the load B. In the red shape, the area is above the element's neutral axis, so Y is measured above the element's neutral axis. In the green shape, the area is below this element's neutral axis, so Y is measured below the element's neutral axis. So it is import important to consider some general takeaways about the first moment of area. As the point you want to measure gets farther away from the neutral axis, A decreases and Y increases. In general, the closer you, the point you want to find is to the neutral axis, the greater the shear stress or flow is at that point, generally being the greatest at the neutral axis. Shear flow is zero at an edge since the, since the area of Q is zero. We measure the increasing area of Q in the direction of shear flow. This area may increase laterally rather than vertically as, in I, as seen in I-beam flanges. And we'll see what this means soon when we look at an example. So in order to find shear flow, we may consider some steps to help get us started. First, the shear flow at free edges, the edge is not on the loading axis, is zero. Generally, we start at the top of an element to find free edges. Next, we move horizontally or vertically across a section with shear flow increasing in a constant direction. If we hit a juncture point, such as transitioning from two flanges to a web in an I-beam, the shear flow combines at this juncture. Shear flow increases until the neutral axis and begins decreasing after. Finally, as shear flow approaches the bottom free edges, it goes to zero. It helps to look at shear flow profiles for a variety of shapes to help get a better feel of how shear flow travels. And you can see some examples, examples of this on the figures on the right. Now, when we consider shear flow, we consider it for thin walled elements. And this allows us to make a few important assumptions, particularly um, how shear flow travels along juncture points. A thin walled element is one where T is much less than D or B. And you can see on the figure on the bottom right what I mean by T, B, and B. These assumptions allow us to ignore differences in shear flow along dimension T and allows us to smoothly transition over juncture points, such as from flanges to a web. Without these assumptions, the shear flow formula would not be valid along the element's thickness at the juncture and at the juncture points. We would have to use a complex mathematical analysis to properly develop a shear flow profile which is too complex for the context of this course. And on the bottom left, you can see um, a more, I guess, realistic uh, depiction of how it would look. And we're kind of simplifying it. Now, to help us better understand how to find shear flow, we may look at an I-beam example. Consider an I-beam with the given di information. Dimension T is 30 millimeters. Dimension D is 400 millimeters. Dimension B is 300 millimeters. So the second moment of area is 71566 times 10 to the exponent 4 meters cubed. A load V of 100 kilonewtons, 100 kilonewtons is applied on the vertical plane of symmetry. We must find shear flow at points A, B, C. These points are denoted on the figures in red. A is on the left flange just outside the intersection with the web. B is where the flange and web meet, and C is in the center of the web and on the element's neutral axis. So first we may find uh, shear flow at A, a point along the left flange. We need the area up to A, shaded in red, and the distance from the neutral axis of the shaded area to the neutral axis of the element Y. So first, we may find the area A. The area A is half of B subtracted by half T and then multiplied by T, which gives us an area of 4,050 millimeters squared. Then we must find the distance Y. The difference between the neutral axis of the elements, the neutral axis of the section, is half D subtracted by half T, or 185 millimeters. In the first moment of area, we multiply these two values, which gives 749250 millimeters cubed. From this, we, from this, the shear flow at point A is found to be 104.7 newtons per millimeter. Next, we may find the shear flow at B, the point where the two flanges in the web meet. We need the area up to B, shaded in red, and the distance from the neutral axis of the shade area to the neutral axis of the element Y. Y in this case is the same as the previous example since the neutral axis of the shaded region has not changed. So the area B is just um, B multiplied by T or 9,000 millimeters squared. The distance, as I mentioned before, is the same as the 485 millimeters. So this gives us a first moment of area of 1665000 millimeters cubed and a shear flow of 232.7 newtons per millimeter at B. So finally, we may consider the shear flow at point C, which is on the neutral axis of the element. We must find the area covered by the shear flow up to this point and the distance from the neutral axis 
of this area to the neutral axis of the entire element. So the area um, created by the shear flow to point C is B multiplied by T added to D subtracted by T multiplied by 2. This gives an area of 90,200 millimeters cubed. The distance between the neutral axis of this area to the neutral axis of the element is a bit more complex to calculate. We must use a centroid formula. The centroid is equal to the centroid of the segments, making up the total area multiplied by the area of each segment over the total area, as you can see in the general formula. We can consider the neutral axis of this element as our relative position, since calculating centroids is always done with respect to a reference. From this, Y was found to be 109.3 millimeters from the neutral axis. So this gives us a first moment of area of 2098560 millimeters cubed and a shear flow of 293.2 newtons per millimeter at point C. So to better understand our results, when we look at a figure of the shear flow profile along the I-beam element cross section, C is the maximum shear stress, as you can see, uh, denoted on the left figure. So if we continue analyzing the shear flow in the flanges until the vertical axis of symmetry of the I-beam's cross section, we would have seen the shear flow at the beginning of the web is double the maximum shear flow in each flange, as you can see denoted on the right figure on this, on this slide. This is because the shear flow in the flanges combine. This transition is not immediate. However, we assume it to be immediate due to our thin wall member assumption as stated earlier. Additionally, another interesting observation is that the shear flow profile in the flanges was linear and in the webs, it's parabolic. This is because at the flanges, the shear flow was only a function of increasing area as the neutral axis was kept parallel to the area and kept parallel to the neutral axis of the shape. On the web, however, the shear flow was, at a, was a function of both changing area and changing neutral axis distance. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to ask now. Uh, could you explain a bit more about what you mean by the uh... The shear flow like combines um, yeah, so, the flanges. Um, you see in the figure left here. So this isn't actually completely accurate. Uh, it's more like the one on the right. So basically, uh, the Q max in each flange occurs along the vertical axis of symmetry, and then it combines. You can see it's Q Q max flange here. So that's what I mean by um, they combine. The shear flow essentially adds. And what I meant with um, our thin wall assumption was that. This transition is not immediate, but we just assume it to be immediate. Uh, does that answer the question? Yep. Okay. Anyone else have any questions before I move on? Okay. So next we're going to look at how to find the force developed on nails due to shear flow. So consider the previous problem. Um, if we have nails where the web and flanges meet, as you can see on the left figure, so for our example, when looking at nails, the I, T, D, B, V is the same as the previous example, and the values are given on the bottom of this slide. And the distance between each nail is assumed to be 10 millimeters, and the area occupied by each nail is 400 millimeters squared. There are two formulas for finding the force in each nail. So either the force in each nail is equal to the shear stress at the nails multiplied by the area each nail occupies, or the, for the force in each nail is equal to the shear flow at the nails multiplied by the distance between the nails divided by two. Note for the distance between the nails, the distance is measured parallel to the direction of shear flow. So to calculate um, the force for our example, we, we will use shear flow as we have already previously calculated it for point B, and that's where the um, web and flanges meet. So the shear flow was previously calculated to be 232.7 newton per millimeters. So if we plug that into our formula, this gives us a force in each nail of 1,068.5 newtons. So does anybody Questions about um, the nails, the force of nails due to shear flow? Okay, then we'll move on to our last topic on how to find shear center. So, so far we have considered loads B, which are applied on the center of the top section of elements. This loading does not work for elements, not symmetrically vertically, in their cross section. When a non-symmetrical element is loaded with the previous assumed loading, they will be twisting in the element in addition to bending as a result of moment, while previously only bending was developed due to moment. This twisting is undesirable and it must be corrected to properly apply shear flow and shear stress formulas. So in the figures on the slide, the two on the left represent the previous loading case for a vertically symmetrical element. No twisting is developed as a result of the moment and only bending moment occurs. However, in the figure on the right, 
the previous assumed loading develops twisting an element in addition to bending. In order to find the shear center, we must convert shear flow in the sections of the element into forces. These forces are considered along each length that is straight, that is, a length without any turns, and with these forces, the moment may be assessed. In the example below, the sections are A to B, B to D, and D to E. Along the horizontal sections, the sections perpendicular to the load, the force developed is given by the formula, force is equal to the integral of shear flow along the section's length. The varying length is denoted by S. The force in the top and bottom sections are equal and opposite in direction to satisfy equilibrium in the X direction, which I'm assuming to be the horizontal axis in this case. Along the vertical sections, the sections parallel to the load, the force developed is given by the formula, force is equal to the integral of shear flow along the section's length. The varying length is denoted by S, as, in the, as it was in the last case as well. The force in this case is denoted by V, since the shearing force in the vertical direction must equal the shearing force V to satisfy, to satisfy equilibrium in the Y direction, or the vertical axis. The force is per perpendicular to loading direction, in this case is section a to B and D to E generate a moment couple defined by moment is equal to the force in each segment F multiply by additions between the midpoints along the length of each section H. With twi the twisting of the element will be opposite to the direction of the force couple. To counter this moment, an opposing moment must be generated by the force V along the section parallel to the loading direction. In this case, um, section B to B. This moment is equal to the force generated uh, by the force generated by the shear flow V along the section multiplied by the shear center distance E. The shear center distance is measured from the centroid of the section with force V. Essentially, the shear center is where, is where external force must be applied to prevent twisting due to the unbalanced moment couple. The main formula for shear center is shear center is equal to F multiplied by H over V. This is derived from the moment balance formula B multiplied by E is equal to F multiplied by H. In the figure on the bottom left, we see where the shear center must be applied. The figure on the bottom middle shows an example of how force vectors must be resolved to find the shear center by breaking them into their components and balancing forces on the vertical and horizontal axis. The figure on the bottom right shows an example of how an external element may be applied to an existing element to allow the forces to be balanced um, by utilizing the shear center. To solve for the shear center location, the following steps must be considered. First, the first moment of area must be given as a function of the distance traveled along the section length, and this distance is denoted as S. Then we must integrate the shear flow with respect to S to find the force over the section's perpendicular sections. Last, we can solve for E using the integral used to calculate F, H, and V. V will cancel out, as we'll see later. So for the first step, the first moment of area must be solved for as a function of S. Both T and Y are constant, so only S must be considered as a variable. Y is given by H divided by 2. The moment of area developed along the length, S, is given by S multiplied by T multiplied by H divided by 2. The corresponding shear flow formula from substituting in this first moment of area may be seen below. For the second step, we must find the forces in each section perpendicular to the load direction. We can find this by integrating the shear flow over the length of one such section with respect to the length along the section S. From integration, the formula for force in these sections is given by V multiplied by, multiplied by T, multiplied by H, multiplied by, multiplied by B squared, divided by 4, multiplied by the second moment of area. Now we must isolate and solve for the shear center. When we substitute the formula for F into the shear center formula, we see that V multiplies out. We then find the second moment of area for the element. In this formula, I neglected the term that has T cubed. This is due to our earlier thin wall assumption as stated earlier. Since T is much less than B or B, the second moment of area it generates will be negligible and does not need to be considered when finding the shear center. After substituting in the second moment of area and simplifying, we get E is equal to B divided by 2 plus H over 3B. From this, we can draw some conclusions about the shear center. E in this case is dependent on the ratio H over 3B and is independent of T due to our thin wall assumption as we ignore the second moment of area it generates. The bounds on E are 0 to B divided by 2, and E is defined by a three-dimensional reciprocal function, meaning E is dependent on two variables. 
If we did not assume that element was thin walled, we, will need, we would need to compute T complicating calculations. This formula is general for elements of this shape. For members of other shapes, the same stress, the same stress might maybe apply to find shear center. Find how shear flow varies. First, find how shear flow varies over a section. Integrate shear flow to find force on sections perpendicular to loading. Find V on sections parallel to loading and solve for the shear center. In this case, we do not need to solve for F or B. To do this in the general case, you will need to uh, solve for forces in terms of V on the perpendicular directions and parallel directions, and then equate the forces generated in the perpendicular direction multiplied by H to the forces generated in the parallel direction multiplied by E. E is the only unknown here, so it may be solved for it in um, these general cases. So does anyone have any questions about this topic? Uh, I know this one's a lot to take in. Okay, if there's no questions then, uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and I hope you could learn you learned a little more about uh, shear flow today and how to apply it to seismic.